Open your Bibles to Matthew 13. We are going to the table of the Lord. So hopefully you already got your elements ready. At home. How? The communion or the Lord's Supper is practiced by just about every church that is out there, commemorating the new covenant that we have in his blood. And they also remember and have their congregations remember that it's a reminder of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And that he will come again to receive us to himself. And I think that's wonderful. No complaint by me. Unfortunately, there are two myths around the table of the Lord that have come into existence and have circulated for quite a while. And these two myths are actual practices by many churches, especially fundamental churches and Christians. And of course, these two myths are based on wrong interpretations of God's word. God's word not cut straight or rightly divided. Myth number one, you want to write this down. Now, if you haven't gone to other churches, you don't know much about this, or if you haven't read and researched this out, this might be all new to you. It might even be strange. But believe me, it is practiced. Myth number one, that partaking of the elements at the table of the Lord or the communion service is only for believers. Only for believers. That's damnable heresy in my opinion. It's false doctrine. There's no truth to it. Myth number two. Failure to partake the elements or the communion in a worthy manner will result in death of the partaker. Now, there's other things also, but those are the two main ones. Myth number one and myth number two. I repeat... Unfortunately, too many churches practice these principles that they established and laid down and passed on to their congregants that you have to be a believer only and you have to partake in a worthy manner or else it will result in death of the partaker. I'm not going to get into myth number two tonight. I want to look at myth number one, which, in my opinion, partaking of the elements, going to the table of the Lord, if you're not a believer, there's something you shouldn't do. It's for believers only. That's far worse, in my opinion, than even myth number two. And if you have done any research or study on the subject, if you don't go to churches, usually the pastor, sometimes it's not the pastor, but usually the pastor conducts the Lord's Supper or the communion service portion. 
And if it, at the beginning of that, what should be a celebration and a remembrance of what Christ did for us, and a reminder he's still coming back, they turn it to something that is sickening. It's the only way to really describe it. And before the communion service starts, they usually make a request. I've written it down here because there's even ministers' manuals that put forth this garbage. What you should do prior to going to the table of the Lord. Just listen to this. This is a paragraph taking, taken from a practice that, it's, that is practiced by many, many churches out there just before they go to the table. Usually the one conducting, usually the minister or pastor of the church says, the Lord's Supper is an ordinance commanded by our Lord Jesus Christ and commemorates the new covenant made effective by his death upon the cross. This supper is for believers only. Oh, really? And those who are not believers should not partake. Therefore, it is to you that we ask that you please abstain from partaking of the bread and wine. Most of the time it's grape juice because they're too self-righteous. I'm going to read it to you again. I want it to sink in. This damnable doctrine made up by man that they can't really get it from Scripture unless they twist the Scriptures. The Lord's Supper is an ordinance commanded by our Lord Jesus Christ and commemorates the new covenant made effective by his death upon the cross. This supper is for believers only. And those who are not believers should not partake. Up theirs. Therefore it is to you that we ask that you please abstain from partaking of the bread and wine or grape juice or whatever you want to call it. Pompous can't say what I really want to say, but you get, you get the idea. Talk about favoritism right off the bat. What does it do to a person that's, say, visiting that church for the first time? Oh, they were greeted by the greeters. Happy for you to be here. It's good to see you. You're going to find this place to be your new home. And all the blah, blah, blah salesmanship nonsense of trying to get a new convert to your church or a new member to your church. But this first timer to your church, and let's just say he's an unbeliever or she's an unbeliever. But they're searching, they're seeking because something is drawing them to hear more about Jesus. Think about it. You're rejecting what he's commanded. Did he command it just believers to do it? To partake? Show me chapter and verse. Talking about making that person feel very uncomfortable. Very isolated. They felt it good coming in because they don't know what to expect. Friendly greeting. Made himself emotionally Accept it because everyone was so nice as he was coming in to take a seat. And now, sorry, you're not part of us. You cannot partake. Talk about feeling isolated. 
Talk about feeling singled out. If I was that person, I would felt felt I would feel like I was an outcast. What a wrong impression to give someone that's seeking Jesus. To find out more about Jesus. So much for the friendly church greeters. <laughs> you don't think that statement I read to you, which is a common statement that's made prior to going to the Lord's table, just flat out rude. Well, like everything else, Scripture has to be our guide. The rightly divided Word of God has to be our guide. Because the request that I read to you, which is common practice in many churches, is unscriptural. It's improper. As I said, it's rude. Go to Matthew 13. Matthew 13, and I've preached on these, chapter, these verses before. Verses 24 to 30 is concerning the wheat and tares. And then you get over to verse 37. Well, how, how does it read? He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. Verse 38, the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. But what did he say about the wheat and tares? Now I'll go back to verse 30 in that same chapter. Let both grow together. See, Jesus is giving instruction to his disciples and I'm sure his disciples wanted to root out the tares from among the wheat. But what did Jesus say? What did Jesus tell them? Let both grow together until the harvest. I repeat, let both grow together until the harvest and in the time of harvest I will say, who? Christ. Not someone in your church, not your pastor, not anyone. Christ. I will say to the reapers, gather you together first the tares and bind them in the bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. You see, can you make the connection? What I just presented to you the first 15 minutes of this message? The person that read that I read that paragraph that I read to you, where is it? I'll read it to you again. I want this to sink in. The Lord's Supper is an ordinance commanded by our Lord. Jesus Christ commemorates commemorates the new covenant made effective by his death upon the cross. The supper is for believers only, and those who are not believers should not partake. Therefore, it is to you that we ask that you please abstain from partaking of the bread and wine or grape juice. Hmm. Let's go back to the visitor. One that's seeking the truth, the way the life. Spirit might be drawing that person. But if you really think about it, he's been asked 
to identify himself, if you really think about it, as a tear. Not as part of the wheat because he's an unbeliever. Think about it. These pastors are just as guilty as the disciples who probably wanted to separate the wheat and tear. And Jesus said, no, let both grow together. This visitor has been asked to identify himself, whether they realize it or not, to the congregation. Because as the elements are passed out, and most churches are not that large, they're not, what you, not, not like what you see in television, it's going to be noticeable if they don't take the elements. Oh, I can see the self-righteous ones now. He's a tear. Make sure he doesn't get anything. He can't partake with us because we're believers and he's not. According to them, each person in whatever church they're in, including the pastor, associate pastors, and so forth, is either a wheat or tear, and they have identified them. Who makes them the identifier? Who died and made them God? When is the identification and separation part of the word of God? In this case. It is Jesus' concern. I'll read to you again. Let both grow together until the harvest. And then he'll do the sorting out. He'll do the sorting out. makes you wonder. And I'm sure these are well-meaning pastors and Christians in these churches that are participating in the table of the Lord portion of the service. To me, they're discriminators. They are insensitive. I gotta read that again. I don't know why I keep putting it down here? Where was it? Here it is. The Lord's service is an ordinance commanded by the Lord Jesus Christ and commemorates the new covenant made effective by His death upon the cross. To suffers for believers only, and those who are not believers should not partake. Those of you, and I'm going to have you turn to it, I was, but I'm not. At the Last Supper, when he was given his disciples instructions, how to remember him, and he took the bread and wine. Ask yourself. Ask yourself. 
Read it. It's in the gospel records for you, for you to read. Did Jesus exclude anyone? Did he? And he knew, friend, that he was going to be betrayed. And who sat at that table partaking? I can tell you who. Someone that was a tear and not wheat. But Jesus didn't exclude him. Who? Judas Iscariot. Someone that was sitting at the table where Jesus was sitting and took and particip participated and partake, partook the element, excuse me, the bread and the wine, the symbol that would eventually be his bread, I mean his body and his blood. Not the physical body and physical blood, but symbolically as we are going to our nourishment. That's why I say you can take this anytime you eat anything. It's a wonderful opportunity to say, Lord, I remember you. I remember what your precious blood did for me. I remember you sacrificed your body for my sake. And I also remember that you're coming back. And I am to not sit on that information, to proclaim it in the way, in the capacity that I've been called to do. Jesus was sitting in, at the same table with somebody that would betray him. Shortly after partaking along with every other disciple and whoever else was there. He actually was a tear. But Jesus didn't exclude him, did he? No, he included him. Jesus took the bread. The bread that he broke. And he, who did he give it to? Besides all the other disciples. Judas Iscariot. He was the recipient, recipient of the broken bread. Was he not? This is the man who would betray Jesus and turn him over to the temple authorities. And when Jesus said that someone was going to betray him that was sitting at the table, it was Judas Iscariot that rose up and said, Is it I? And all Jesus said that someone at the table would betray him that very night. Jesus didn't exclude him, but he knew what Judas was. He ju knew what Judas was going to do and betray him. Jesus knew he was the son of the devil from the beginning. If you really think about it, you take modern day understanding of how you go to the table of the Lord. Jesus, using modern day understanding, Jesus should have said, you know what? It's Judas. Let me point to him just in case you forgot who he was. He's the one. Let's leave him out. That's what modern day Christians and pastors would do in their churches. But did Jesus? If you really think about it, Jesus does violate myth number one. <laughs> you 
And he also took the cup. This is the cup of, of the new covenant. In what? In my blood. In Jesus' blood. And he said, do this as often as you drink it. In what? In remembrance of me. Jesus allowed Judas. Most of us wouldn't. I'm sorry, just that's the way we are. And unfortunately, there's too much of that. That's why we look deep into the Word of God and find out what the real truth is about any topic or subject, including this table of the Lord. Nonsense being peddled that you cannot participate or partake if you're a non-believer. Or if you're not worthy. I repeat, Judas, Judas allowed him to partake along with other disciples. Back to, let both grow together until the harvest. And then Jesus will sort it out. If you think about it, and I repeat, Jesus, by example, intentionally let a man that would betray him partake of the orange. Amazing, isn't it? Why would you not want to invite someone that you have labeled as a non-believer to the taking of the bread and drinking of the cup. You distort, it, distort its purpose and meaning. They distort its purpose and meaning by their actions, self-righteous actions. If you look at Jesus' example, the visitor of that church should have been made to be welcomed, or felt welcomed, excuse me, and invited to the very special remembrance and celebration that the rest of the church was about to enjoy. Talk about a profound influence that would be. And maybe the turning point for that person who was seeking Jesus. If you don't think this scenario hasn't happened many times over, then you got your hand, head so buried in the sand that this message is not for you. <laughs> You'd even take James. Go to James. Chapter 2. He speaks to these hide minded individuals. I'm getting there. James chapter 2, verse 1. Well, not verse 1. Let me see where I want to pick this up from.
My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of, go go Lord of glory, with partiality. For there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes. And you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, You sit here in a good place. And say to the poor man, You stand there or sit here at my footstool. footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? I can apply that to what I just preached to you and to myself. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? I'm sorry, it's an evil thought to consider yourself a believer and to instruct non-believers to participate in communion or at the table of the Lord. And of course, their self-righteous attitude will say because we're concerned for the non-believer. Why? Where's your chapter and verse? And of course, myth number two, well, we don't want to create a situation that we might even lead them to a spiritual death if you want to take the physical death the interpretation which some do if they take in a matter that it's not worthy and they miss the whole concept of what Paul was saying to the Corinthian church in their coming together and leaving some out which they were champions of doing and only the, the elitist and the more wealthy individuals got to participate in that remembrance and celebration of what Christ has done. The church is full of stupid traditions. The church is full of doctrines that not, does not come from the Word of God. They have made themselves God and they have elected this be the sorter between the wheat and the tares. It's not your job. Well, while somebody comes in and is destructive to the church and the body of Christ, there's other scriptures that deals with that. that is given for instruction how to handle those types of situations. The table is not to be used for that purpose. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your past is like. I don't care if you're a believer or non-believer. If you come to this table and put your focus on Christ, because that's where it should be, to put it on anything else besides Jesus is to find yourself in the position where you're not worthy because you're more concerned about anything else except Christ. Christ is our focus at this table. He's the only thing that's worthy all that other stuff, including everything that's happened in your life, is secondary. All he, and he deals with that on a personal level. And he's giving you plenty of instruction on that too, how you overcome, how you strengthen yourself, and even how you conduct yourself. As long as you don't establish some righteous attitude that develops a, your own personal tradition how things are done. But at this table, he's the only thing, and things not even the right word. He's our only concern, period. Nothing else. Focus him in on him only. 
what his shed blood and his broken body did for you. It's the ultimate, ultimate rescue plan of all time, my friend. You have been given a fresh start when you become born again in Christ. You now have his DNA in you. Not the DNA of the first Adam that screwed things up for all of us. And we're born into Adam's sin, which becomes our sin. But when you become truly born again, your composition changes, believe it or not. And you now have his DNA in you, his spiritual DNA in you. An amazing rescue plan that only he could provide and which was promised for millenniums prior to his first coming. And at this table, we also remember that he is coming again. He's going to come again to wrap things up in our eternal life. without Satan and his minions and evil, wicked spirits that are constantly trying to bring us down will no longer be a factor. Not to mention, as I preached many times, all the inexhaustible rewards that he is looking forward to. By giving what he so desires to give us. He has a great desire to reward us. Why wouldn't you not want to focus on Jesus? Think about it. You got anything better than that? I sure can't think of anything better than that. And don't let these wheat or proclaim wheat tell you and keep you from focusing in on Jesus. Because that's what this, this table and the elements reminds us, what he, what reminds us of. What he has done for us. What a way to really, if you want to use the word the way they use it, witness to someone is by going to the table. And participating in the table of the Lord's service or the communion service. What a wonderful opportunity to be a grand witness of Jesus Christ. If you go to a church that practice keeping people away from the table of the Lord because they think they're non-believers, I would run out of that church as fast as I can and never look back. And some of you tonight are... You need to face that. And you need to draw a line in your own life. Well, I have things there that I just like about the church. If they get this wrong, there's nothing else to like about that church. Period. Because it begins and ends with this. Christ, life, death, burial, resurrection, and his return. And the gracious gift that he's given us. A new start to be born again with his DNA. Nothing else can be said. So with that, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done to me. And let's always continue to keep our focus on, in on him and remembering what he did for us. You got it? Now let's take the elements. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Play a song. 